Hello there and welcome to another Bow Beats video. So in today's video, I'm gonna try and explain how you can set up a live stream using OBS. It's aimed at music producers and artists, but I'm sure that a lot of other professions, creatives, or even gamers can find this video interesting. And even if you don't intend to use OBS, that's the free streaming software that I'm gonna go over, open broadcast software, even if you're not intending to use it, a lot of the information in this video will still be relevant as it has to do with camera choices and how to set up a multi-camera stream. Now since this is an in-depth guide, here's a little index of what we're gonna go over. Today's video is massive and I think you should treat it as a course in live streaming, a Bow Beats masterclass, if you will. So first I will explain my own multi-camera setup, basically to inspire you to see what's possible. Then we'll talk about how to choose a camera specifically for live streaming. Next up, I'm gonna give you an overview of how to get your video into the computer. And as a part of that, I'm gonna go over how to use a video mixer to create a multi-camera stream. In chapter six, I'll show you how to set up a stream from start to finish in OBS. And after that, in chapter seven, we'll talk about the problem of getting DAW audio, audio from your music production software into OBS. And I'll be sharing some solutions for both Windows and Mac. And this video was sponsored by Roland, who makes the VR1 HD. It's a video mixer that I use to create really cool multi-camera live streams. So we're gonna go with that later in the video as well. So let's start with the basics. What do you need to get started? Well, you need a computer, you need a microphone, you need some kind of camera, you need some way of getting that camera into the computer, you need some way of getting audio into the computer, and you need to download OBS, which is a free software. I've linked it down below. But more importantly, you need a good idea of what it is you want to stream. So here's a first bit of advice. Don't worry too much about the quality of the stream. You can have the best audio and the best video, but without a solid idea of what you want to stream, it doesn't really matter. If the idea is not good enough, no amount of crisp audio and video quality will save your stream. Now with that important disclaimer out of the way, let's look at different technical solutions and how to set it up. Now this here is my multi-camera setup. I don't just use it for live streams, I also use it to produce the videos I make for my channel. At the core of the setup we have three Canon cameras, two EOS M50s and one Canon EOS R with a Sigma 18-35 lens, and the third M50 is actually this one that I'm shooting this part here on. Now all of these cameras here are hooked up over HDMI into my video mixer and you'll get a more detailed rundown of how it works and what it does. But basically it combines three HDMI sources, one here and the second one. Since this is both an audio and video mixer, I'm running a microphone into it. For audio, I'm running stereo in, so it has RCA inputs. And if I want more inputs, if I wanna say use multiple channels from a U-Rack or multiple synthesizers, I can plug them into my mixer and then go stereo out from the mixer into here, giving me level control. We also have this little beauty here. Now this here is an external monitor and recorder called Atomos Ninja 5. So basically I used it to monitor my VR1 HD and I can also record into it either directly from the camera or from the VR1 HD. And something I really like by using a video mixer is that you can do very easy screen in screen. So something like this. So here we are, seeing two cameras at one time. Inside of OBS, my video mixer shows up as a webcam. So what you're seeing here is the video source from the VR1 HD, but I also have mouse and keyboard and a stream deck. So the stream deck is super versatile. You can set up this button here to basically do anything in OBS, or you can even use them just for your music software or for controlling some other piece of software on the computer. Super versatile, definitely recommend it. And here I can select webcam. 
So now I can switch between the VR1 HD and its two cameras that are hooked up to my webcam, which is over there. So I have three cameras connected over HDMI and actually two webcams that I can mix between. And here's a little example of what the stream can look like. The first choice you need to make when you're setting up your live stream is what kind of camera are you going to use? There's plenty to choose from. We'll start by talking webcams. I use a Logitech C920 and a C922. Now a big pro of using a web camera is that they're super easy to set up. They're also very cost effective. They're also quite low latency compared to other options. So when you're plugging it into a computer, you don't need to sync up the audio and video, making it easier to sync up multiple web cameras and audio sources. But there's of course quite a lot of negatives as well. Firstly, the image quality is not that good on a webcam, especially in low light. Secondly, it's also quite hard to tweak the image to your liking. Now you do have an application on the computer, so you can change the settings, but I've just found it very difficult to get a good image that way. And thirdly, if you're an artist, a creative, a music performer who relies a lot on different lighting setups, maybe you have LEDs that are blinking, this just won't do. It will be very hard to get a good image. Now, if you want to step up from the webcam, you can actually use your smartphone as a webcam, right? It's dead easy. Download an app on the smartphone, connect it over USB to the computer, install a plugin for OBS, and it should work. Now, I will go over this in detail a little later in the video when we're talking about how to get the video into the computer, but in my testing, it's been working surprisingly well. The pros of using a smartphone as a web camera is firstly, well, you probably have a smartphone already. Secondly, the image quality will be a lot better than say on a web camera, of course, depending on what smartphone you actually have. Another plus is that it's powered over USB when you are actually using it as a web camera. And that way you don't have to worry about it running out of juice midstream. Also, they're not prone to overheating like some cameras are, so that's a plus. But there's a few negatives as well. Firstly, tweaking the image on a smartphone is a little bit more cumbersome, isn't as easy as on a normal photo or video camera. And also the low light performance is quite poor. Next up, let's talk photo and video cameras. Now this is the route you wanna go if you want the best possible quality for your stream. Now almost every big brand have cameras that are suitable for live streaming. And since I don't have experience with all of them, instead of going over different models, what I will do is I will talk about some very important things that you have to look out for when looking for a DSLR mirrorless camera or video camera for live streaming. Firstly, if you intend to use an HDMI output from the camera into some kind of capture card, you do need to make sure that HDMI is clean. This means that it has to output a clean signal without these graphics here. Otherwise, those graphics will be recorded. So look for a camera with clean HDMI. Now, another thing you should be looking for is DSLR or mirrorless or video cameras that can be used as webcams over USB. So by hooking up a USB cable to this M50, I can actually download uh, Windows software. So it's only for Windows right now that lets me use this as a web camera in OBS. Another potential problem that you need to look out for is that some cameras shut off after a period of time. Which brings me to another point, make sure to get a camera with a decent battery because on the M50, for example, these small batteries, they don't last that long. I can use this as a webcam for about two hours when I was using it over USB. So about two hours on one battery. A lot of cameras also have the options for dummy batteries and that basically lets you power the camera from a normal wall socket. And also two types of cameras that I would not buy is the GoPro, unless you really need an action camera, the low light performance, the image quality of a GoPro is 
well, it's not ideal for using indoors, for example. So unless you need uh, an action camera or a really wide angle camera, I wouldn't go with GoPro. I also wouldn't go with compact cameras, which doesn't have in interchangeable lenses. So if you can't remove the lens and exchange it for something better in the future, I wouldn't go for that either. Which brings me to the pros and cons of using a photo camera or a video camera. Well, first up, obviously, the image quality is a lot better on something like this than a smartphone or using a web camera. It's also easier to change the image settings, especially if you have an articulating flip screen like this. There's also a plethora of lenses to choose from and lenses make a lot of difference in terms of image quality. And also I talked about low light performance and the low light performance is a lot better on a DSLR than on a web camera or a smartphone. And there's a few negatives. I talked about the battery size being a potential problem. There's also the problem of certain models going and overheating after a certain period of time, record limits, cameras shutting down after a period of time. So these are all things to watch out for. And ultimately cost will be a big downside. This is a cheapo camera around $500 uh, without the lens. And with a good lens, we're talking about a thousand dollars or more so i would say spend at least a thousand euros maybe 1500 euros or dollars on a good mirrorless or dslr camera with a decent lens in this section of the video we will go over how to get your video from a webcam smartphone or a dslr camera into obs now we will be getting ahead of ourselves because I haven't really gone over the basics of OBS, but don't you worry, in the next um, section of this video, you'll get a very introductory tutorial for OBS and how to set up scenes, sources, cameras, audio sources, all the good stuff. So let's talk about how you get video into your computer. First up, web cameras. Super simple, plug in the USB, install the drivers, and go into OBS and add the web camera as a video capture device. And that should pretty much be it. And if you're using your DSLR or mirrorless, the principle is the same. Install drivers, connect over USB, and add it as a webcam inside of OBS. A little bit more complicated is setting up your smartphone with OBS. Now, unfortunately, I only have an Apple smartphone, so an iOS device, because, um, well, I'm a bit of an Apple sheep. <laughs> But the principles that I'm going to show you should be fairly similar for a non-iOS device as well. So setting up your iPhone's use as a webcam is very simple. You purchase the app, then you go to their website and you download the little OBS plugin that lets you add the iPhone as a webcam. Take the iPhone, hook it up over USB to your computer, open the app on the iPhone, and then when we're inside of OBS here, let's create a new scene here. Let's call it iPhone. And here, use the little plus marker here, and then you have iOS camera. If this doesn't show up, it means that you haven't installed the plugin correctly. You press it, iOS camera, and now you can see that there I am. Hi, hello there. Now you have it here as a source and you can drag it out to fit the screen. You can also see over here that we have an audio input from the phone itself, so you can use it as a microphone. Now let's do a little camera test and microphone test. So this is a recording with the iPhone 8 Plus, the built-in wide-angle lens. And yeah, the mic you're hearing, the crappy audio, is the microphone on the iPhone 8. So now I'm recording the video with the iPhone 8 Plus camera, and I'm using a much better microphone. This is the Rode Procaster mic going into my audio interface. Now you will notice some latency, some lag, basically the audio, the vocal audio, and the video won't be synced up perfectly, but that's not a problem. We can fix that. Now I have a LED lamp over here, just a very simple circular LED lamp bouncing off the wall, and I have this lamp over here. It's a Philips Hue light just bringing in some ambient lighting. So hopefully it gives you an idea of what you can accomplish with just a camera on your phone. Now if you want to use a DSLR or mirrorless camera and use the HDMI output, there's two different main options. So if you're just using the one camera, I would suggest a capture card. Capture cards are quite inexpensive and there's quite a few to choose from. Now when it comes to capture cards, here are two examples of brands that you could check out. So the first one here is Magewell and they have this capture card here. This capture card supports up to 4K resolution. Now do note that most streamers don't stream in 4K because platforms don't support 4K, but if you want to do a high resolution recording of your stream, this can be an interesting option. 
Another brand known to streamers is Elgato. They have a bunch of different capture cards and I even own one of them. It's an older version, so it's not supported any longer. This is their small cam link capture card. That could be an interesting option. Or maybe go for one of their HD60 cards. Do note that all of these cards are intended for one camera only. Now, if you want to do a multi-camera setup with DSLRs using HDMI out, I would instead recommend a video mixer. In this video, we're going to use the Roland VR1HD because it's actually a really solid video mixer and audio mixer all in one. So let me show you how I'm using it for my stream and some of the cool features that you get with a video mixer. So this here, what you're seeing now, is all being recorded through this video mixer here. It's all done live on the fly, switching between different cameras that are connected to this Roland VR1 HD. A video mixer is an excellent way of upping the production quality of whatever live stream you want to do. Now, what's the point of a video mixer besides being able to switch between different sources? I mean, can't you just use different webcams or cameras hooked up to OBS? Well, a major benefit of any video mixer is that you can use it with any streaming platform that can use a webcam. You can use it with Skype, you can use it with OBS, you can use it with StreamYard, vMix, whatever. It's a hardware unit here that lets you control your live stream, basically, all in one setup. And you don't really have to think that much about what software you're running. Basically, I'm just running the VR1 HD as a webcam inside of OBS. And any changes I'm making is affecting the hardware unit itself. So for example, if I want to change settings to either of these scenes, for example, I'm doing it from this unit itself or from a software on the computer, but it's not tethered, it's not connected to OBS directly. So it's platform agnostic, you could say. Now for any video mixer, you need cameras with clean HDMI. Otherwise, let me show you here, these graphics will show up on screen. Now my Canon M50s only have clean HDMI if you're using them in manual mode. If you want autofocus, you need to get a different camera or step up to a Canon EOS R. Now one great thing about the VR1 HD is that you have scalable inputs. So you have three HDMI inputs, but I can actually input 4K from that camera, 4K from this camera, 1080p from this camera here, or I could take my iPad, for example, put it into the video mixer and it will scale the inputs so it'll look nice, regardless of what you're putting in there. So you don't have to worry that much about what you're inputting into the video mixer. So that's a big plus. Now I talked about this being standalone, that you can do a lot of things from the unit itself. Now there is uh, two different software that you can download from Roland to use with it, but you can change all settings from the unit itself. You have a little menu here. So since I'm recording this onto an external recorder, you can actually see the menu here. So we have video inputs, video outputs, setups for scenes, transitions, you can key, so you can use a green screen, for example, you can do auto switching, you have audio settings, and this really cool feature, audio follows the video, which basically lets the video follow the audio. So if you have having an interview, for example, you can have the VR1 HD auto switch, depending on who's talking. Here's a little demo of that from Roland, because I, I haven't actually used that function because I don't do live interviews. I'm more of an internet guy, but here we go. Hello, Chloe, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Justin. Oh, you're welcome. And how's your day going? It's going great. Thanks for asking. So here you select which camera is going to be active. And over here, you can do scene selects. So we can do picture in picture. And you can also go in here, menu, scene select, scene number E, picture in picture, split screen. We can change where we're drawing the line here and also which inputs we want to use. Now this video mixer is on the more expensive side and there's no doubt about that, but it's because the build quality is really high, the mic preamps sound really good, and also the image that it produces is very nice. It also functions both as an audio interface, a video mixer, but also 
audio processor. So we have four assignable buttons here for audio effects. Hello there, my name is Bo. So you can assign the buttons to a voice changer, for example, playback music, and you can play back from a USB device connected to the back. You can also have reverb. On the audio inputs, there's also the ability to add effects. So here, for example, we can send to the reverb. There's also aux send. There's also dynamics. So we have the ability to have a gate. You can do a compressor on it as well per input channel here for the vocal audio. We can also add an EQ and both of the inputs have phantom power. And the device connects to a computer using USB 3.0 and it should probably be good to note that it's a 1080p output but you can input 4k and, and downscale it to 1080p for example. And lastly in this overview of the VR1 HD is that it has a really nifty function. So besides having control over the mic inputs and the line input, and the level for the dedicated headphones output as well as the main audio, you do have dedicated loopback channels. Now this is super handy for streaming because basically when I'm streaming, I can use this to set the level of audio that's coming back from the computer. So for example, if I'm interviewing somebody over say Discord or Skype, their audio will be tied to this knob here. So if they're a little bit low, instead of asking them to turn themselves up, I can just use this knob here. And while I was making this video here, I didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to do some green screen. So I just duct taped this piece of green cloth here to the background. And now we can uh, switch here to uh, a lovely beach. And there I am on the lovely beach. And we can also do picture in picture, something like this. So now you can see this camera as well at the same time. So having a video mixer is great. It's really nice to kind of offload everything onto this device instead of using a computer and being tethered to a certain software. So I can use this for different purposes, different software solutions, Skype, Discord. I, you know, I can stream from this to Discord directly if I want to or Skype directly or even Zoom. Now you can definitely do cheaper multi-camera setups if you want to, if you're on a budget. For example, having multiple webcams in my setup. I have two webcams as well. So that's the kind of budget solution using two webcams but as soon as you want higher quality video from DSLRs or video cameras you know something like a video mixer makes a lot of sense. Now there are capture cards that can take multiple cameras as well but I would say that I prefer a video mixer it doesn't have to be this one in particular. So for this section in the video it could be a good idea to get a little cup of coffee take a little sip of the coffee and relax because we're gonna go over how to set up stuff inside of OBS. So it's a very basic walkthrough of OBS and how to set it up to get you up and running with your live stream. When you open up OBS, this is what you're greeted with. Now this is OBS on Mac OS, but the Windows version works very similarly. So the main window here shows you the current scene. It's black because we have no sources. We have nothing to show. Now down here, you can see the plus and minus signs as well as up and down. Now the plus sign lets you add a scene. Let's name it scene two. So now we have two different scenes that we can switch between. Next up we have sources. Let's press the plus button here to get a menu. Now we will not go over every single one of these sources. We'll stick with the basic types, but there's plenty of great tutorials for OBS out there if you want to go more in depth. So let's say we want to capture the screen. Well, we have display capture here. Let's call this main screen or screen number one or whatever you want to call it. Here we can select what screen we want to share. Now because the resolution of my actual monitor is much higher than the resolution of the working area on OBS, I have to resize it. So this is what it looks like and you get this nice endless, <laughs> endless screen going on here. Now in sources you can toggle the visibility on or off. Let's add a webcam. So we have something called video capture device. Let's call this webcam one. Here you can see a list of my webcams. So we have the C922 Pro Stream webcam from Logitech. Hello there, here's Bo. And we also have the FaceTime, which is partially covered by the webcam. There we go. 
Here we can also change the resolution and the built-in webcam is a 720p camera. And if we go to the C922, you can see here that we don't have a 1080p setting, but we can just do like this. And we can select 920 by 1080. And we select an FPS value here and there we go. If we want to tweak the settings, it works a little bit differently on Mac and PC. On PC, you can go in here to properties and usually you can bring up um, a little screen where you can tweak the settings. But in Mac, we actually have to go and we have to search for Logitech. So here we have camera settings and we can change the brightness and the contrast and whatever else we want to do. Looks amazing. Now the way this works is that whatever source you have on top will be shown on top. So let's see here. Let's change the main screen and put it on top of the webcam. And let's resize it. So now we're showing a picture in picture in picture, I suppose, in a way. <laughs> so as you can see, you can move around and resize the screen capture. Now let's say we want to add an image. Well, it's very simple. Here we have image. So here I just selected a random image. Now in order to resize quicker, you can just go to transform and we can take fit to screen and we can drag it out to fill the entire screen if we want to. So webcam here on the left, a screen share over there and an image in the background. You can very easily add text as well. So we can just go in here and text a free type. This is Bow Beats on YouTube and we can change the font and we can resize just like I showed you previously. So adding stuff like this is very, very simple. Now we can also add video. So you can have a video here in scene number two, for example, it's blank because we have nothing in here. Now, oh, a small a little thing here. If you want to take, say, the webcam here and you want to use this in scene number two, copy it and paste it. That way it's the same thing. You can, you can resize it here under scene number two without resizing it under scene number one. But essentially the settings are the same. It's the same webcam. It's the same resource that we're using here on both scenes. So let's add a video here. So media source. Let's take this video here that I pre-recorded. Now what you have here is a local file. It's not on loop, but I can set it to loop if I want to. Restart playback when source becomes active. Basically it starts the playback when you change to this particular scene. So here we have a little video. You're not hearing anything from the video, but you can see that suddenly we have in the audio mixer, we have the actual sound from the file playing in OBS. So it's playing the sound from the video file and we could mute it if we want to. So what you're seeing is my intro video. And whenever I wanna start the stream, I'll just unmute my microphone and I'll switch back to scene number one. Hello, welcome to the stream or something like that. Now let's talk audio. So the easiest way to show this is by using audio input capture. Now you can go into the settings and add different audio sources, but in many ways it's actually you more useful to use audio input capture like this because you get a little bit more control. So for example, we could add a microphone and here we can select the built-in microphone, for example, which shows up in the audio mixer, but we could also add the audio from the webcam. Now, if you know that these are mono sources, so for example, a uh, pro microphone is generally mono, you could just go here. You can go to advanced audio properties. Now, this is a really important part. So you click here, advanced audio properties. You get this little more advanced mixer here. Now here you can set the microphones to mono, which is really nice. You can also change the balance and super importantly, the sync offset. So here you can type a value which will delay the signal. Now, why is this important? Well, generally when you have video, the video will come into the computer, into the stream a little later than the audio because audio is, you know, doesn't require that much bandwidth, but video does. Video is more demanding for the computer to uh, handle basically. So sometimes the webcam and the audio won't be synced. And generally speaking, the audio is the thing that you have to offset. So here you can change the offset in milliseconds. Now the easiest way to actually test this is to do, let me close this down, is to do 
a local recording. So here we have start streaming, start recording. Start recording makes a local recording. So you'll make a local recording of whatever is going on in your stream. And then you can listen and look back at it. Now, this is a really good way to test your stream and to see if that everything syncs up nicely. Now, you can also delay the video. For example, if you're blending, say, a mirrorless or DSLR camera through a capture card with webcam footage like I do on my stream, the webcam will not have as much delay as my other cameras because the other cameras are more high definition and going through a capture card. So generally, the webcam is a little, a little quicker to get into OBS. So you want to delay the webcam a bit. Now, under webcam here, we can go to filters. Now, what you can do here is press the plus button and you can add a video delay. So this is what shows up here. And here you can set a millisecond. So we could change this to 500 millisecond, close. So now we have delayed. You can even see it on the stream. Suddenly, suddenly my talking is like way faster if I clap. <laughs> you see that we have a big delay on the webcam. So that's how simple it is to set up. Now talking filters, here's another cool thing in OBS. Here's the mic. We can click filters. Now we can add compressors, expanders, you add gain, limiters, noise gate, and so on, as well as VST2 plugins. So you can press here. And here we can select from all of my plugins on this computer. So for example, we could select the solid bus compressor here. And we can open the plugin interface. And voila, we have the Native Instruments solid bus compressor inside of OBS. Now I won't go into detail on this, there are plenty of great tutorials on it, but just know that you can use your VST2 plugins inside of OBS. Now it does add a bit of latency in some situation, depending on your computer, depending on your setup, what you're doing. So just know that if you're creating a really advanced chain of VST plugins here inside of OBS, you might need to add some delay to the audio or video, whatever, to make it line up perfectly. So now that we've learned how to add scenes and different sources, both video capture, we have the screen capture, as well as audio sources, we can take a look at the different settings. So in the settings menu, let's go to video. Here you can see that I'm using a 1080p canvas as well as output. I usually have them set to the same value here. I don't really see any big reason not to. Now, your resolution will not matter as much as the quality of your content, the quality of your audio, and the cameras you're using. So if you have a shitty webcam, if you have shitty audio quality and bad content, it doesn't matter if it's 1080p, 4K, or if it's, I don't think even 4K supported on, on most platforms, but you get the idea. If the stuff you're streaming is bad, then your stream quality won't really matter here. So you could easily go for 720p and still be fine. So I use 1080p and I also use 25 FPS. This is simply because the cameras that I'm usually using when I'm streaming are set to 25 or 50 FPS because this is the standard for Europe and 24 FPS is standard in the US. Now for streaming, this all depends on the source material. So if I'm using my 25p cameras, then I'll set the stream to 25p. Now, if I were to stream a video game, I'd try to get the highest FPS possible on my stream and the highest FPS that works on the streaming platform. So you have to look into that depending on what you're streaming. But for music streaming and music performances, 24 or 25 FPS is, is totally fine. It's pretty much standard and I see no reason to go higher. Next up, we have the audio tab. And here you can see that we have sample rate. Now. The normal is 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. I go with 44.1. I use 44.1 kilohertz because this is the sample rate that I'm using in my DAW, in all my music software, all my devices are set to it. So use whatever setting makes sense in your setup. It doesn't really matter that much. And then we have audio devices and we can add, for example, the audio fuse here or the webcam. But as I've showed you previously, I'd rather add capture devices inside of the scene. I prefer to do it that way. And then we come to output. Now here I use simple. I also use a video bitrate. 
Now I'm testing 8,000 kilobits per second, but I have gone much lower. And how high bitrate you can have depends a lot on your internet connection. So I have 100, 100 internet, so 100 down, 100 up. So 8,000 kilobits per second isn't really a problem for me, but I have streamed around 2,000, 3,000 as well, should be fine. So I don't really know the science exactly what you should, shouldn't have. I tried around, I haven't seen a big improvement of stream quality when I went from like 5,000 to 8,000. So yeah, take this with a grain of salt. I'd say 2,000 and above is generally fine. Perhaps somebody disagrees with me, leave a well-articulated comment down in the comment section if you do. I've set the audio bitrate to 160, I think I did this because some of the streaming services didn't allow for high bitrates anyway. And down here you can see recording, and I talked previously that you can do local recording. So I'm just saving uh, my local recording to my desktop. And here I've selected indistinguishable quality, large file sizes, recording format. You can set it to different formats here. I use MP4. Now I personally don't use OBS to do local recordings that much. So you might want to check out a detailed tutorial on this if you want to get the maximum amount of quality out of your local recording. And then we come to the last and most important tab here, which is the stream tab. So here you can select from different services. So Twitch and YouTube are of course the most important, maybe Mixer, maybe Facebook. You can also see here Restream. Restream is a service that lets you stream to Restream and then the service streams to multiple platforms at the same time. So if that's something you wanna do, you might wanna check out Restream. So under stream key, you paste your streaming key. Basically all sites that you can stream to gives you a streaming key for your account. You shouldn't share this with anybody. You copy paste it, you set the correct server as I've done here, and then you just click start streaming. And of course you have to set stuff up on Twitch or YouTube depending on which service you use, but this is not a tutorial on how to do that. But now that you've gotten a basic rundown of how OBS works, how to set up a stream, how to add scenes, sources and whatnot, go and test it out. And when you inevitably encounter errors, you can either reference this video or you can look up a tutorial dedicated to the specific problem that you're encountering because there's so much depth to streaming and there's so many different problems that can arise, but there's a ton of great resources out there and I've linked a few in the description as well. Now we've come to a section of the video that was probably the hardest one to record because it's actually quite hard to find a good solution for this. And I'm of course talking about how to record system audio with OBS or how to live stream your system audio. So system audio could be sounds from YouTube, video from YouTube, it could be Skype, but more importantly for us music producers and artists, it could be our music software. Now, if you're not a music producer or artist, you won't have these problems, I think. The problem, of course, is latency. For example, if you're a music producer, you might want to stream the audio from your DAW, Ableton Live, for example, or FL Studio or Cubase or something into OBS. And if there is a ton of latency, it will be a very bad experience. So in this section, we're going to talk about how to solve the problem of recording your system audio, but more specifically audio from your music production software into OBS. And I'm gonna try and explain how to do it with the least amount of latency, because there's a ton of solutions, but not every solution will give you low latency. Let's start off by talking Windows users. And I'm sorry, if you are a Windows user, I have not found a solid solution for recording DAW audio into OBS which doesn't come with quite a lot of latency. But there are workarounds, so let's talk about four different kinds of solutions for Windows users. Firstly, you could use a software solution like VoiceMeter Banana, but it will add quite a lot of latency from talking to a lot of people who are using it and testing it myself. It did add a lot of latency inside of my recording software. So if latency isn't a problem for you, I would go with VoiceMeter Banana. I've linked a tutorial for it down in the description. The second way on Windows is probably the most cost effective and that is getting an audio interface with dedicated loopback channels. Basically, the loopback channels will appear in OBS as dedicated audio inputs that you can select. And then you route the audio 
inside of your software for your Audrey interface so that whatever is outputted through the Audrey interface goes also through the loopback. So it basically takes whatever audio is going on in your DAW and sends a copy of it to the loopback channels that are picked up by OBS. And for example, the AudioFuse Studio has this, some Focusrite interfaces has this, and the Evo 4 I think also has it, but I would definitely read up on it first and look for testimonials online to see if it's actually working well with your configuration. The third solution might seem cumbersome and it's a little bit more expensive, but it's actually proven to work really well for me and friends. And that is using two different audio interfaces. So basically you have one audio interface here that you use for your music software that you use every day for making music. It's set up, ready to go. And then you have a second, could be a much cheaper, more simple audio interface, which you use for OBS. Then you take the audio output from the main interface into the second interface. And suddenly you're passing through all the audio into OBS. You can even have a microphone for OBS on the second interface. So make sure it's at least a four input interface with at least one or two mic preamps. So this could be one really interesting solution if you don't want latency issues, if you don't want to set up a bunch of software. Now I remind you, we're still talking Windows here. For Mac, there's there's a better solution, of course, I mean, it's Apple. I'm such an Apple sheep, I, I know. Wait, what is this? It's a magic keyboard. Yeah, I fell for it. <laughs> and the fourth way, which of course works with both Mac and PC, is to set up a dedicated streaming PC with its own audio interface. So it's basically option number three, but expanded. So you'll have your music production system, computer, whatever you're using, and you'll have a dedicated computer, Windows or Mac, it doesn't really matter. And you're feeding it all the video and audio into the dedicated PC. And this is of course a much more expensive and complicated setup, but what you're getting is a much more smooth experience when you're making music on your computer and you're streaming it from a second computer because you're not taxing the computer so hard. So it depends a little bit on what kind of computer you're using to make music. Now for Mac users, there's simply one single best option that I've found, I tested a bunch, and that is called Loopback. It's quite expensive, it's over $100, but there's a full trial version, you can use it, test it out, see if it works. And I just wanna show you how easy it is to set it up. Not sponsored, not paid to say this, I'm still using the trial version because I'm not really streaming from my Mac, but I tested it out a lot and it seems really solid, giving you the ability to stream from basically any software into OBS without adding a ton of latency. So let's take a look at how to set this up. This here is Loopback and notice how clean the interface is. To show how it works, we're starting out in Ableton Live, and as you can see here, I have the audio fuse set up. Nothing special is going on here whatsoever. Let's add a sampled loop and open up Loopback. In Loopback, you can see that we have devices. These are basically like virtual audio devices that we can create. So let's create a new audio device, let's rename it, and let's delete this source here. And as you can see, it's a two output device and that's all we need for OBS. So let's add a new source. Let's select from this menu here, a running application. We select Ableton and as you can see, it automatically connects to the outputs. Now if we press play, you can see how the audio is not only running inside of the software, but it's also running inside of our newly created device. Now let's add loopback to OBS. So we press to add a new source and we select audio input capture device. And from the list, we select the device that we created and voila, we have sound inside of OBS. Now let me show you that it works by playing a demo project I have here in Ableton Live. And I'm recording this using OBS and the iPhone 8 Plus as a webcam. Now this is just a demo song that I had laying around, but yeah, let's listen to it.
Because as you could hear, loopback was passing the audio into OBS without me actually changing anything inside of my music software. Now, if you're on a budget, there's a software called Black Hole, which works sort of similarly to loopback, but it does require quite a lot more setup time. And if you don't want to deal with creating aggregate devices and setting stuff up, loopback is just way simpler. And then there's also Soundflower, which a lot of people use. It's also quite easy to set up, but it doesn't have all the functions that loopback has and it doesn't have a clean easy to use UI. So my advice would be if you're on Mac, download the trial version of loopback and test it out because man, for me at least on my setup, it's, it's been working really well. Now a big disclaimer, just because something works for me doesn't mean it will work for you. There's always a lot of headaches when setting up a stream. So be ready to, you know, put in the time to set it up properly and some solutions that I've recommended won't work for your system, your needs specifically, but hopefully it gave you an idea at least of where to start. So in today's video, we looked at camera choices. We looked at how to set up a multi-camera setup, how to get audio into your system and set it up in OBS. So hopefully you found all of this interesting, entertaining. Let me know in the comment section if you did. This video was a lot of work getting good information across to you all. So hope you enjoyed it. If you want to support what I'm doing, check out patreon.com slash bowbeats. And also big thank you to Roland for chipping in and sponsoring today's video because it took quite a long time testing everything and making sure that I put out good information. So thank you so much for being here. Have a great day. Talk to you later.